press start. Yay. Congratulations to Zoom. They went public today. So the, I the meeting system that we're using, they just went public and their founder got uh, $57 million, like what he sold today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Okay. Good money. Yes. It's good software. It, yeah. It doesn't yeah, it's suck. great. No, I like it I, a lot. There was the most hilarious exchange on NPR yesterday where they were commenting on it going live. And the person who was making the comments just started to be go on and on about how awesome Zoom is. And then she's like, oh, I'm being told through my earpiece to say there are other companies <laughs> that do it. It was just sort of like... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> she she crossed the journalistic line for a moment with her sheer enthusiastic. Yeah. It's enthusiastic. too bad. This was totally uh, Google's business to win. I mean, they started yeah. Hangouts. We all use the word Hangout, and mm -hmm. yet we don't use the Hangout software anymore. No, it's, it's just not as good. Yeah, it's too bad. I, I mean. I like Zoom because I can just send someone a link and they click the link and then they show up in the meeting. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's no, when are you going to be online? Let's coordinate, send a text message, search for you on a directory, all of that. You just click a link and there you are. And like and if you've never used Zoom before, then you'll have to configure some stuff. But apart from that. And you can have standing meeting links. So, so like, my personal Zoom account, your personal Zoom account, I know that I can always find you at a given link. Paranor, you weren't a moderator, but now you are. <laughs> uh, with great power. Just saying. He is worthy. Uh, okay. I'm going to say hi now. Everyone's had a chance to say hello. I'm going to say hi to Alex A., Andy Cowley, Arnold Post, Koi Wagoner, Daniel McCool, Eric Knapp, Pastor Gagne, Gordon Dewis, Graham W., Guido Bibra, Harry M., James Aberson, Janelle Duncan, Jessica Feltz, Jim Smith, John Drake, John Suffield, Justin Wilcox, Jorn Albert, Michael Bommet, Nance Graziano, Nichols of the Yard, Paranor, Richard Hayes, Susie Murph, Umu, Uncle Bill Druin, Wayne Johnson, and Zapfan Zapfan. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Richard Hayes is asking if anybody in the UK saw the the David Attenborough program. Uh, we didn't, because we're you know I'm a filthy Canadian uh, and you're American. You're actually a clean Canadian. <laughs> we're we're close. I, sometimes we can get you, BBC. You do stuff shower, here. but I am I also we do sing uh, "God Save the Queen" uh, every morning, so we should be able to get access to the BBC. But uh, we did. As a child growing up, we sang God Save the Queen. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, it's pretty funny. See, yeah. no one can sing the Star Spangled Banner, so we always say, like, America the Beautiful or something. You like guys that. did, um, well, the, uh, the, you, one of your songs, like, you guys used to do the Pledge of Allegiance every day, right? Yeah. 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 And then we also usually sang. Yeah, there was some song that's actually the same tune as God Save the Queen. But it's pretty funny that, that that's what we did. So um, anyway, <laughs> um, so global warming, apparently we're all doomed. And that's like if you watch the Planet Earth show that was on Netflix, like, you know, Carla, my wife, is just a gigantic fan of, of those kinds of shows, you know, Blue Planet, all that. And she was like halfway through and she said, I can't, I can't watch it anymore. Oh, yeah. No, I, yeah. I listened to an interview David Attenborough did. And I was like, I agree with everything you're saying. And my heart hurts too much already. I am going to go eat chocolate ice cream yeah. and read science fiction. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and <laughs> sell my car. Yeah. Like there's a there's, <clears throat> there's a scene where walruses are falling off of a cliff. Yeah. It's because wal it's also because walruses are nearsighted and don't <laughs> understand well, they, but they wouldn't be trying to climb a cliff if there was room on their beach, yeah. and they wouldn't need to be on the beach if there was ice. Yeah. So it's – anyway, it's just – it's horrific. And there's and there's like, oh, look at these animals playing, and oh, look at these beloved animals dying in horrible ways because of, of global warming. And and so I, I feel like <clears throat> we are now 
we've come to the point where people are taking this all pretty seriously, which is wonderful. And now I just hope we get this stuff in going quickly. We've got record high prices of gas here in, I think in Vancouver, it is like the highest prices of gas in all of North America. Dollar seventy a liter, which I think works out to, I don't know, eight dollars a gallon or something, six dollars a gallon. Anyway, a lot. Um, and you know, of course, I drive yeah. an electric car now, so it's not my problem. But um, but still, you have a fully electric car. Yeah, yeah. I bought a Leaf. Okay. I bought a used Leaf. I traded in my my Honda Civic for a for a used Leaf on the lot. Someone would sell on the Honda dealership. I'm like, can I trade this Honda for that Leaf? And, and the guy was like, yeah, okay, done. And uh, I haven't, you know, now I just keep plugged in at my house. I love it. It's yeah, so I good. Yeah, I only drive like 2,000 miles a year. And so I still have my 1997 yeah. Jeep Wrangler. And my husband's car, which I use if I'm going into St. Louis, because it's not an environmentally hateful vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, It it's between the two cars that we're driving like 2,000 miles a year. It, so. Electric car is so great. Like, I just, I can't, for anyone who doesn't have one, like, like the range, sure, is a problem. But, you know, we have an, another car if we need to go longer distances, which we never do. Um, so most of the time, we just drive around. an island. Yeah, well, for sure. I mean, it's a big island, right? But you just, you just drive most of the time. I, you know, they have terrible range. My Leaf has a range of, like, 150 kilometers. And yet... I'll drive around all day running tons of errands and I'll only be down to 50% of my battery life. So anyway, uh, if you're on the fence and you can pick up used Leafs for super cheap, like I've seen them in the US, you can get them for like 5,000 bucks. So highly recommended. And, you know, and then just keep, if you have two cars, that's the one you should be uh, be using for sure. But anyway, I'm, uh, I'm not I'm not gonna get a Tesla can't afford that. So, so to patrons. the people who are asking in the chat how many of those miles are to and from the airport, <laughs> Most. Uh, 75% of them. So there, there are two places that our car, three places that our cars go. Grocery store, vet appointments, and airport. And vet appointments are like four or five times a year. Uh, so there's one grocery trip a week because I can't bring home all the groceries on my bike. And if we have to run any other errands, it gets combined usually. Um, and then there's the airport, but there's a lot less of that. Yeah. So I ride my bike a lot. I put yeah. more miles on my bike. Yeah, you don't want you don't want to you don't want to face the chilling consequences of flying when you think about that. I think one flight across country is the same as like three quarters of a year of driving. This is, I bike ride a lot yeah, yeah yeah anyway so but the point is i think it feels like people are starting to get it and they're starting to be willing and, and i think partly is we're just feeling it like we've had the weirdest weather here this spring yeah. it's been so bizarre we had a weird winter a weird fall uh it's it's madness and i think now we're all experiencing it across uh from the wildfires that we have in British Columbia to the droughts that they're experiencing parts of the U.S. to uh, the flooding that happens in Europe, et cetera. Yeah. So, okay, we should yeah. do a show. Now that we're thoroughly yeah. depressed. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Richard, for, uh, for sending us down on that tangent. Uh, I want to see that show. I can't wait till it's available to me here in Canada. I don't. I won't be watching it. I'll, I'll totally watch it. Are you my kidding? my fantasy novels. Yeah, no way. I, I need to just experience the pure horror of, uh, of what's going yeah, on. Yeah, I so read the I science remember. papers and that's yeah, enough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, okay. Let's... Now all I can think about is how, like, the last Yangtze River turtle died this yeah. week. The last female turtle and. Yeah. Uh, let's get going. <laughs> oh, you want to you want to talk about okay, super we're, volcanoes we're again? That'll make here. you happy. Come here, Eddie. Come here. Come on. all the way up, Eddie. Here, I have I have I have a plastic container. You can look out. <gasps> there we go. 
Lots of dogs remaining. <gasps> Sometimes this is what's required. He's in doggy heaven. What is what was that? It was lentil salad. Nummy. He apparently likes vinegar. Hmm. Oh, dogs will eat anything. Mm, anything. He hates, he hates ketchup. Oh, but there's not much ketchup. There's vinegar and ketchup. Oh, yeah. No, we. Yeah, dogs will eat anything. Okay. Here, you can have it on the ground. There you go. Okay. Well, and, and our our dog, right, Ona, she, you know, she was a rescue, so she'd spent some amount of time on the streets of Oakland eating yeah. garbage, and now has very fancy uh, tastes, right? Like, she does not want to eat the same thing she ate yesterday. That is for peasants. She wants something <laughs> new and interesting, ideally served out of a garbage can. Uh, yeah, yeah. Eddie, Eddie hates ketchup but will eat anything other than ketchup at any time he used to hate spicy food but he's adapted i feel like there's something important we should be doing right now we should be recording an episode that's a good idea okay tell me when you're ready i'm ready are you ready i'm ready i'm, I'm gonna press record. record jinx all right tell me when you're recording I am recording. Confirm recording by saying hello to Susie. Hi, Susie. And not the Susie Thank who's you. watching us right now, Susie, but the Susie who's going to be listening to this and editing it later, Susie, just so you can keep your Susie. Hi, future Susie. Future Susie, yeah. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 527, Astronomy of the American Southwest. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Uh, really good. Uh, it's been a nice, relaxing week so far, actually. It's been good. Some follow-up stories. We, you know, the Bear Sheet Lander crashed, and but now Bear Sheet Two is 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 go. Um, the Falcon Heavy landed perfectly, except it didn't. Uh, the the uh, the core booster fell over in the high seas and broke in half, and half of it was that. returned to Poseidon. You didn't know that? No. No. Yeah. So it landed and then oh, fell man. over in the high because because the octo grabber. Uh, can't grab the core booster of a Falcon Heavy. And so, yeah, it fell over and the top crunched off and, and went to the went to Davy Jones' locker. And they, the, need, they need an octo-grabber massive yeah, edition. An octo-grabber heavy, yeah. Yeah. And, of course, yeah. we've still been just feasting on black hole news. So it's, it's been a – but it's been a lot more chill. But it's been, <laughs> it's been good. Um, it was a – let's just say I was very burnt out on space news – Last week, all excited See, about space news again this week. Yesterday and today have been like story after story after story. And what I loved is today there was a theme of when asteroids invade your solar system. And it was a pleasing theme. It was a really pleasing theme. Yeah. Ancient peoples had no light pollution and they knew the night skies very well. In fact, they depended on them to know when to plant, when to harvest. Today, Pamela talks about the archaeoastronomical sites of the American Southwest, which coincidentally is a place you are going to be traveling to relatively soon. It, it is true. Next August, I am going to be leading an astro tour through the American Southwest, departing from Tucson, going to places still being determined, but will include national parks and observatories, and ending it all in Las Vegas. Now, we aren't going to get to visit a lot of the archaeological sites that I'm thinking today, but the reason that I'm leading that tour is because that's the part of the country where I spent my summers growing up. It's where my grandparents are. It's where I went to graduate school. It's where I did a summer REU as an undergrad. And so when I picked the topic for today, it was basically like, okay, 
the news is heavy. I want to pick something that will bring me joy to read. And I know I, I, kinda... I, I just know I know exactly how this went down. You were like looking at sites that you were going to be going and thinking about it and then just nerded out and went down a rabbit hole of cool historical archaeological sites in the American Southwest. Yeah, no, that it's so actually I was playing Ticket to Ride with Keeper of Maps and Paranor going, I have no idea what to talk about. I have no, I am out of ideas. And it was out of me bemoaning how I was like out of ideas as I faced the week's world news that I was like, what if? And it was like, archaeology. Let's talk about archaeology. Let's talk about things from before the expletive hit the fan so yeah 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 so but i mean the irony of course is that the places you're going to be talking about are not places you're going to be going on your astro tour i think that's the point is like is is that you this is pure pamela rabbit hole this is you finding something and nerding out about it for uh for our benefit it's it's true and this is going to be part of a series uh and we are going to talk next week most likely about the modern astronomy being done in the american southwest so today we start with the beginning times and next week we're going to talk about how we're learning about the end times awesome well uh so wh- where do you want to start which peoples which which sites which well, monuments it probably makes sense to start at the beginning and the beginning is Chaco Canyon, as as far as the archaeology goes. This is the place of the Ansazi people. Uh, this is, if, if you read a lot of Neil Gaiman, this is the peoples where coyote originated in the stories. And the Anasazi went on to fragment into the Pueblo tribes that include the Zuni, the Hopi, and many others. Now, the reason that we're starting with the Ansazi isn't just that they're the old people, they're the, the first ones is how they're often referred to, but they also left us amazing archaeological records of how they traced the seasons, the stars in Chaco Canyon, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And it's also one of the very few sites in the world where the supernova of 1054 is believed to have been recorded. Yeah, I just surprised Pamela with actual, an actual picture of the place that she's describing. So for those listening, uh, there's a stunned silence there for a moment. But uh, this, <laughs> this is what the audience is seeing as well. Uh, is this what you're talking about, Pamela? Why, why yes. Okay. Yes, it is. All right. So what, and so what kind of features are, are at this at this place? So the the ten fifty four supernova is recorded. At least this is one of the explanations. What what is seen is is there is a a cliff face rock face that has a handprint, a crescent moon with the points facing do- down towards the horizon which indicates it's near the horizon as the moon uh, comes up, it rotates. And so you can actually tell what phase of the moon you're looking at based on how it's oriented. It always uh, has the, the bright side pointed towards the sun. And then it shows a bright many pointed star next to it. And while the mundane explanation of what this is Um, says, oh, it's just the crescent moon, the planet Venus, and a handprint. What is also looked at is perhaps this is one of the very few examples of the 1054 solar uh, supernova being recorded. This particular supernova went on to become our ever-beloved Crab Nebula. And For whatever reason, even though it shined many times brighter than Venus and stayed put unlike Venus, it wasn't noted by Europeans that we know of. There is like a known recording of it in Arabic literature. 
Uh, there are a bunch of notices about it in Japanese literature, in Chinese literature. And, and part of this is explained as, well, the, the Europeans were more closely tied to Dark Ages and Christianity at that particular moment in time and wouldn't have seen the sky the same way, whereas the Chinese and the Japanese were using it as record keeping. They were actually careful recorders of the sky. And similarly, we had a... a we use the sky for day-to-day -day stuff culture in the American Southwest where one of the ways that they figured out their calendar was to stand on specific rocks and look for the sun to rise and set aligned with specific places. And they also had sun towers scattered throughout the American Southwest. That's cool. So what, what's a sun tower? It's a cute little squat tower a uh, meter or so wide, a couple of meters tall. And they typically have an ability to get in and out. So you need a door. But once you're inside, there are specific windows that are lined up to capture the sunrise or sunset on specific dates lined up with specific objects on the wall. So these would be designed to conform to the local latitude and longitude, the local geography. So these were built by someone who was like, okay, I have to put the window here. And on this day, the sunlight's going to shine through. Okay, quickly record on the wall. Okay, I'm going to put a monument here. And once these were created, you could sort out a calendar based on the extremes of the the summer and winter positions of the sun and by looking at how the sunlight shined in through these windows and where it hit the wall you could build a calendar that is really cool it's kind of like uh well i'm i'm, I'm sort of thinking manhattan hinge um <laughs> yes but after the fact right so if they had actually designed manhattan for the perfect day waited for the sun to come straight down some streets and then built a whole city around it then that would be the same thing but it, as opposed to an interesting coincidence where the sun happens to come down some streets on manhattan on one day of the year at a certain time um but and so like what would they use something like this for apart from just feeling really proud of their ability to predict <laughs> the movements of the sun well well calendars in general are a useful thing and the moon is an annoying thing one of the thing that was one of the things that was quickly realized by uh, academics who tried to interact with what remained of the indigenous peoples of North America was they have a very different relationship with time than Europeans do. And for many of the peoples of North America, the calendar would be div divided into two chunks. And, and here, this is particularly true of the Pueblo nations that descended from the Anzazi. And with the Pueblo nations, you might have half the year that have very poetic names that are tied to things like, uh, this is the moon when the snow breaks the branches off the tree. This is the moon when the eagles fly. And each tribe had their own names, but what would typically occur is you'd have half the moons of the year that have these amazing, specific, glorious names. And then the other half of the year, it's like colors. And this is in part because directions had a sacred place in the Pueblo peoples. And you'd have the six sacred directions. Those would be given six months. And then you had the other months of the year which were treated more fluidly by being tied to, okay, let's look outside and see what's going on. Okay, now we know the name of this moon. And the reason that you needed to have that fluidity is you can't divide the number of moons evenly into the length of a year. Right. Yeah, and it's like 29 and a half days is the length of from full moon to full moon. That's so you it's just... 12 moons and 11 days per year essentially <laughs> right and, and so you can't it, get you can't get them to line up nicely no oh that would have no. been so convenient and and the way they get around 
not having this work is by paying attention to part of the year very carefully. And in some of the most northern latitudes, which we're not discussing today, other than this bit, they didn't even bother with some segments of the year. It's like, okay, we've got no moon, we've got no sun, we're going to suffer. And then once you have that return of the sun, once you start to see the special days of the year coming, then you start noting, okay, if I stand on this rock and I look out at that ridge line and I note the rising point of the sun as it migrates across the horizon, this tells me the special days of the year. And by looking for the first moon after the sun, that allows you to keep a better calendar. And there's actually some sacred ceremonies that are supposed to coincide with horrible to figure out things like the full moon closest to winter solstice which is one of the hardest things to observe because you have these short days you have miserable weather the probability that your ability to observe is going to be well blocked by clouds is great and there's records of people essentially making fun of the the star the sun priest in their village because they got it wrong and so planting was off and these poor individuals got blamed right now here in illinois with my modern european calendar i know i don't plant anything before may one and i'm sure you have something mm -hmm. similar yep. there in Vancouver. yep may long weekend oh you don't have it um middle of may we don't <laughs> we don't plant anything and in massachusetts it was memorial day weekend because it's even colder there well we tie things to certain dates they didn't quite have the capacity to do that so they had to use a, a combination of the sun and the moon to get a anc ancestrally determined through repeated experience this is when you should plant and when the priest got it wrong well you know who got blamed. right yeah sorry we call it victoria day and that's on uh, may 20th and that is of course to celebrate queen victoria who is very near and dear to our hearts here in Canada. <laughs> it's a thing. It, it really is a thing. Now, we happen to have Victoria as a city here in Vancouver Island, but that's not what it's for. But, yeah. Um, I mean, when you look at Chaco Canyon, it is this just this stunning sight, this enormous sort of half circle with these embedded circles inside of it. How much of that is astronomy related and how much of that is just living spaces and various other celebrations and, and you know, and other community events? Well, based, based on knowing that today's multiple Pueblo nations are descended from the peoples of Chaco Canyon, the the modern peoples have their great earth lodges that have four massive pillars that mark out the cardinal directions north south east and west and they suspend a round roof that is meant to be a reflection of our sky and it is off of these cardinal points it is off of the great sphere of the sky hemisphere is what we see that they build in their architecture. The great circles, some of them are called kivas. They were only open to men. These were the meeting places, the religious centers. But the Earth Lodge was a place for everyone that was also round. And, and so we see these shapes that come up over and over, and it is a reflection of, of seeing themselves as, as being tied to the stars, tied to the seasons, tied to the earth and the sun. And it, it was all one thing within their philosophy and their culture. Now, we have lost a lot of the details of this, unfortunately. Uh, the majority of our understanding comes from the Zuni people. They were geographically uh, hard to get to by the Spanish. So unlike many of the other Pueblo, Pueblo peoples, uh, such as the peoples of Taos, which is now basically a ski resort, uh, the, the Zuni people were isolated. They've managed to maintain many of their traditions across the centuries. Uh, so there is wiggle room in our understanding. Now, we see, though, this ability to see the architecture 
get reflected in multiple places. From Chaco Canyon, for reasons that aren't really well understood, Chaco Canyon grew and grew and grew, became an amazing metropolitan city. Uh, but for some reason around 1150, it pretty much emptied out. Hmm. One of the leading theories for why it emptied out was a massive drought. These things happen in that part of the world. And there was a simultaneous rise of the peoples of Mesa Verde, who were also the Anasazi people, but that was a later city up in Colorado that grew up um, growing inside the canyon walls again. And again, in Mesa Verde, you see these same aligning your architecture so that sunlight shining through walls can mark the seasons. Uh, Chaco Canyon Sun Dagger is the most famous of these, but we see this idea of sunlight shining through small spaces to illuminate symbols getting repeated over and over throughout the architecture of the America Southwest. And that's got to be where, for example, uh, the um, Harrison Ford uh, raiding a lost ark uh, had, you know, opened up a door using sunlight, or it was a crystal, that's right. And things had to line up perfectly on the right date. I'm sure they got the inspiration from from something like that. And, and it was a common way of keeping track of calendars. We saw it uh, similarly done in Egyptian architecture, uh, mirrored again throughout Greek. Uh, we need more understanding of what was going on throughout the rest of the Middle East and Saudi Arabia is finally allowing archeologists in. So hopefully we'll get more understanding of that part of the world. Uh, the sun dagger is perhaps the best case of, oh, those rocks are doing something useful. In, in the British Isles, they moved rocks to create solar alignments. Mm -hmm. In Chaco Canyon, there is a set of three rocks that align just right to create a thin dagger of light that passes through the rocks and onto a wall behind the rocks. And on this wall, there's carved a beautiful spiral pattern. And on the equinoxes, the sun dagger pierces the center of that pattern and on the solstices, it hits the two extremes, the bottom and top of that sun of that um, spiral pattern. So the motion of the dagger of light passing between these three stones that appear to be a natural formation was taken advantage of right. to create a calendar. That is just that's amazing, like a natural sundial. Well, and just think about all the study that would go into getting that perfect. Some human being basically watched the stone and did whatever the historic equivalent of penciling it in was right. until they knew exactly where it would hit on the equinoxes, until they knew exactly where it would hit on the solstices, and then carved into the rock. You only get one chance. To do that, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Take a couple of years. Make sure that you know you you measure twice before you carve once. Uh, so and, I mean, I mean, is were there uh, a? I mean, this is just one location. I mean, but the same theme was repeated on a lot of these sites they had like mini versions of the same kind of facility right so your local clock and and this is where we go back to to the sun towers and also the difference in how they paid a, attention to time uh the pueblo people uh the hopis the zunis uh they they didn't think the same way about noon and 8 p.m. And so there's this sacredness to certain days, but not a sacredness to time. And there was also the, yeah, we fully acknowledge sometimes it's 12, sometimes it's 13 solar cycles. So we're just going to, well, look outside and see what's going on. But they did rely on that sun. And this is where we go from that old, old sun dagger seen in Chaco Canyon to instead having the sun towers. Now, beyond just noticing the, the sun, they also watched the constellations. And while their understanding of many of the different 
uh, uh, constellations, what they were, differed from the European ways of looking at the constellations, although everyone seems to have seen Scorpio as a scorpion, no matter who you were, it was a scorpion. I, but beyond some of those exceptions, they were picking out many of the same stars that we pick out. And this also went into their understanding of the seasons. And unlike many other cultures, they, they took these constellations and just like we do today with Think Geek, they turned it into their day-to-day -day food storage items. So you can find crocs that had the constellation Orion in the lid. Oh, really? So yeah, they would, so, and, and like, that's when you open it, when you can see Orion, that's when you open this, the lid and eat the food. Well, I don't know if that's the case. Okay. We can't know that. We simply know there's food know. containers that had constellations. That's on my the theory. <laughs> If you see well, Ryan, then it's, sense. then it's, you know, then it's probably time to eat this. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so they, they knew their stars and it got tied into the lore and it also got tied into the lore, the not knowing which moon it was. And this is a fabulous combination of, they knew on this date, the sun would set behind that place on the ridge. They knew in this season this constellation rises and is high and it was passed through the oral traditions. But there's also a fabulous Zuni tale of the, the person who was murdered because they said, um, well, the current season is, and they named the moon and the person responded, no, it's the moon of the eagle flying you moron. There's an eagle flying behind you, except they said this in their ancient language. And the person turned around to look at the eagle and got their throat slashed. And the murderer responded, don't you know, there are no eagles in this season. <laughs> and, and so it was right, widely acknowledged that the season moons were fluid but the sun and the constellations were set. That's uh, that's awesome, what and horrible. And but and that that is the nature of a bunch of these legends. Humans humans are humans throughout all time, and one of my personal greatest sadnesses is there were amazing civilizations all across the United States that just died off horribly after the Spanish and Dutch yeah. began exploring simply because European diseases. Yeah, they brought their little yeah. friends. So so the Mississippian people who lived where I live now went from having one of the largest cities in the world to just not existing anymore. So there's so much that we can't know. And uh, this is where we're so lucky that the Zuni were so isolated. Yeah. Um, were there any more sites, any more interesting features that you wanted to mention in the last couple of minutes? Um, I, I think this is one of, of the main sets of things for now. We will be going in to discussing uh, all of the telescopes that, that got built. Um, they also, I should say, used the, the constellations on uh, rattles that eventually got turned into the, the shakers used in Marachi bands. The original ones used by the native peoples uh, also had constellations on them. So they used it on musical instruments that were ceremonial in many respects as well. So the takeaway from all of this is the, the native peoples of, of the American Southwest had this fabulous time is fluid the moon misbehaves the sun is solid we can trust its rising and setting to determine when we should plant and stars are cool so put constellations on your musical instruments on your food gourds and we are part of our universe and we build our largest permanent settlements to have this earth lodge that reflects the cardinal points in the sky in its architecture and I wish we built more architecture that incorporated, well, our universe into its design. That's a that's a great idea. It's sort of, uh, I mean, we we definitely think about that a bit here in Canada. When we build a house, you want a, a south facing 
whenever you you know you have part of it face the south so that you can get some sunlight because it's cold and wet and so you want to maximize the chances and so you do think about the 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 larger sort of facing but you don't necessarily i would love to have a house with some feature that on one day of the year you get this shaft of sunlight or something that perfectly goes to some other location that would be so cool i so i'm so it's I'm going to add so, that, you know, to my blueprint for my future house. To to let the audience in on one of my happy little no longer secrets, part of the reason that my recliner is placed where it is placed is because on the most miserable winter mornings in January, the sunlight comes through my office window, shines through the fish tank, makes all the plants start bubbling oxygen and casts rainbows all over the walls. So <laughs> I organized my office furniture to maximize winter sunlight. That's that's incredible. All right, on that note, uh, Pamela, thank you so much. Now, before we go, do you have some names to say? I do indeed. We are, as always, here thanks to your support through Patreon. You keep us going and allow us to help Susie keep her kids in college. One is there now and is facing finals. Amanda, we wish you the best of luck. You're going to rock it. You always do. And you are making university possible for Susie's kid. <laughs> so I want to thank Jay, Alex, Anderson, Dustin, A, Rolf. Father Prax, Jason Graham, Ron Thorson, Claudia Mastrulani, Holly Mayer, William Jones, Brent Clenop, Jack, Brandon Wolverton, wordorigins.org, Jeremy Kerwin, Chad Colopy, Joshua Pearson, William Lauer, Joe Wilkerson, Arthur Latz, Hall, Mark Stephen Raznock, Brian Kilby, Tyrone Fong, Iggy Hammock, Omar Del Riviero, Margaret Robinson, Neuter Dude, and William Andrews. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. We'll see Thank you next you. week. Bye bye. Okay. And now we save. And now we save. We save. Let's see. Project four. 527. Yeah. yeah, at a certain point, you don't even know which hundreds you're in. <laughs> right. So with 365 days of astronomy, we realized we've put out more than 3,600 podcasts. And so we're going to do a celebration on April 27th on Twitch where we're bringing together as many of the podcasters as we can. I think you got an email that you haven't responded to yet. Nope. Um, okay, then my email didn't go through. Um, but we're trying to get as many people who've contributed audio as possible to join us oh, to basically be, fun. be part of our birthday party. Uh, 3,600 and 50 days of astronomy. We're, we're calling it 3,650 podcasts later, the celebration. Right. That's amazing. Uh, all right. Well, hit us up if you have any questions. We're going to stick around for another 15 minutes or so. So I'm seeing folks saying that they're going to dig into the astronomy history of the Southwest. Um, a general archaeoastronomy book that I was using as one of my references today that I really love. It's old, so you can get it cheap on Amazon, but you may end up getting it used, is Early Man and the Cosmos. Uh, the person who wrote it, uh, Evan, Evan Haddingham, uh, is now, uh, he works on Nova at WGBH, but he used to do archaeoastronomy, and this is just a fabulous book. That's cool. Sean Kenny is saying consider Antarctic observatories for a show. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the telescopes helped out with the, with the event horizon telescope. There's the bipolar, uh, no, sorry, the bipolar, the bicep two. <laughs> What's well, it polar in it? The bicep two experiment, which uh, looked for uh, primordial gravitational waves. 
Uh, there is the, um, and there's a couple of, of, there's a bunch of telescopes here. It's a great place for a telescope. It's like the best place for a telescope. Oh, there was, did you see the, the story coming out about Larson C is, is melting even faster than they thought? Are we talking about that again? Are we back Sorry. to global warming? I didn't mean to be. You mentioned Antarctica and I just went there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> the, bi the bipolar telescope. Yeah, it was also uh, one of the prime observing sites for Shoemaker Levy Nine because there was an infrared observatory that played a major role there. John Suffield is just noting that all the constellations were named by agricultural societies, but none of them are named after plants. Is there no plant based? No tree? No. Well, and calling them agricultural societies is is perhaps. So the Navajo were not strictly agricultural, uh, and they they have their names for things. The Pueblo people uh, were agricultural, but they also had animals in their lives. Uh, so it, it's not like they were vegan societies. And let's face it, we all like things that have faces. Mm -hmm. um, Hal McKinney asks, how long do supernovae stay noticeable in the night sky? It depends on how close they are. Uh, the um, I believe, I want to say it was visible for about two weeks is what they, they think for 1054. Um, and, and that's as a visibly bright nighttime object. It might have initially been a daytime object, but probably not. Betelgeuse will be a daytime object when it goes. Yeah. Come and on. Ada Carr. Betelgeuse. Ada Carr will be a daytime object go anytime you can explode any day um justin wilcox is asking do you know if the sun sets and sunrises the same time every year so it it on the same day relative to the stars so when the earth is in its the same place in its orbit the sun will rise and set at the same time if you ignore daylight savings time, which is an artificial construct. Now, exactly when the sun rises and sets is far more complicated than strictly where the, the Earth is in its orbit because of the tilt of the planet um, being convolved with other things. If you want to go down a rabbit hole, look up the equation of time. This is why on the equinox, the sun isn't straight overhead at local noon. Mm -hmm. It's actually straight overhead a few minutes after local noon. Um, so it's a fun rabbit hole. I recommend it as a place to it's go. another one of your rabbit holes. Everyone needs rabbit holes to explore now and then. Uh, oh, and Sean Kenny is noting uh, Ice Cube. That's a good point as another yeah. telescope. I did a whole episode on Ice Cube. So if you haven't, definitely watch that. And there's a South Pole webcam apparently. And penguins are awesome. Let's just face it. Um, uh, Woody Heads, I think, is asking. I'd love to hear anything about the first black hole picture. That was the whole episode last week. Go back one episode. Go back one episode, and that's all we talked about. Uh, and we could easily just continue to talk about it. But, you know, we'll move on. It's old news. I just we'll, and we will definitely talk about it again when we get the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way. And and there's a YouTube video going around that is claiming to be processing of the Sag A star black hole data from the Event Horizon Telescope. It's not. No one has released it. Mm -hmm. It's really not out there. I promise you. <laughs> Did you see someone had a the a redacted page from the Mueller report, and that was an image of the black hole. Yes, it was I all did black. See it was just like the whole yeah. page, which yeah. is one black box. Yeah, that was pretty funny. Um, Larry Beckham says we'll talk. <laughs> we'll quit talking about the climate crisis when CO two is back under three hundred fifty parts per million. There was a really cool uh, piece of research that I saw. Someone is figuring out how to make a perennial grain, which I thought was pretty clever. So like a what? we 
a perennial grain. So right now the way wheat works, right, is you, you plant your wheat in the spring and then it grows up over the summertime and then you harvest it and then mm -hmm. all of the growth that happened is all done. Mm -hmm. But a perennial grain, for anyone who's a gardener knows, they just keep coming back year after year. So you, it's like a grass. And so yeah. you, you harvest the top of the grass, but the root structure remains. And so if you actually swapped out all if they could get and they're working to make the yields of this bigger and bigger and if you could get to the point that that it could have the same kind of yield as wheat you could literally solve global warming with this grass because you're because now you are building up a a grass layer year after year after year it just gets thicker and thicker and thicker and stores all of this carbon dioxide in the soil it's a really cool idea so it's, that's the that's the thing that stops me from yeah. being so sad is that I just keep seeing these really cool developments or people as people are coming up with ideas. If you there's a technique you can do to make concrete with with uh, sequestered carbon dioxide like like limestone that's been you know that you artificially make by pulling it out of the atmosphere. Again, if you took all of the concrete that gets used around the planet and made it with this stuff, you would completely remove the excess carbon dioxide one one of the things that makes this all hard for me is all of the really good ideas for what will truly make a difference require major parts of the economy to evolve and change and as we've learned from the coal industry there is a lot of reticence on the part of politicians to make the changes necessary that will for a period of time largely unemploy people. So if you go to perennial grains, suddenly you no longer need Monsanto and their yearly supply mm -hmm. of one use seed. Mm -hmm. And companies like Monsanto are going to have lobbyists that are saying, no, we should not do this. Yes. It's it's Yeah. It's going to take someone being willing to say, we're going to short term wreck the economy in order for there to be a long-term salvation yeah. of our planet. And when I say long-term, if we were to add no new carbon to our atmosphere, even under some of the most positive models out there, it's still going to take us a hundred years to start to see a decrease mm -hmm. in carbon levels. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no. So, uh, but, but it might be that we find that the impact actually isn't that bad and you, um, and we can start to draw down faster than we were expecting so yeah um uh janelle duncan asks how do leap years affect the accuracy of a solstice and equinox i uh, solstice and equinoxes don't care about le leap years the sun is simply going to say hi i'm lined up now and the planet is going to go okay there was this many days since we last lined up and it wasn't an integer so, so the problem is that I believe it takes 364 and a quarter days for the... 365 like, and a quarter, yeah. Okay. Days for the Earth to go around the sun. And that extra bit builds up over time. Now, there's still going to be exactly one day a year when the sun is at its northernmost point as it migrates north and south of the equator. There's still going to be exactly one day a year when it's at its southern, southernmost extreme. What time of day it is at its most extreme will vary because of that non-integer. Right. But when you're lining things up with a distant cliff, you're not going to notice that. Right. Um, the other issue, of course, would be the precession of the equinoxes, that, yeah. that there's like a 13,000-year cycle that as the earth is wobbling on its on its axis and that will definitely take your you know it, i'm trying to think what it'll do right because it will change the day of your calendar but it will still give you the right day to plant your crops like that'll never change i'm trying to think you're 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 maybe it will you'll be you're going to be like I the orientation the of the of the planet will change so that summer turns into winter over the course of 13,000 years, right? And the, the constellations that are seen in the sky change and all that, right, over a long period of time. So I'm just trying to think if those will throw your calendars out of whack over long periods of time. 
Anyway. Yeah. And so I, here I we are a thousand years after those calendars were created and they would be not as accurate because that's a big amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you're going to think on this over the next week. Um, but Dustin King is asking, how did the Pueblo peoples think the solar system and the universe were structured? Do you know what their sort of cosmology was? I, so I, I don't think we have any records that give us the level of details that they had simply because disease killed off so many. And the earliest uh, conquistadors to go through the region just didn't care. It wasn't until the late 1800s that we really started sending archaeologists to uh, and anthropologists to talk with the people who were still alive. Mm -hmm. So, so much information has been lost. And we don't fully understand the record keeping system they had. We know that information was knotted with colored ropes into chronicles, but we don't know how to read the knots. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the bottom line is they, they all made stuff up. Yeah, but, but it, wasn't, it wasn't any less based on observation yeah. than what any of the other peoples mm -hmm. in the world were. Anyway, yeah, yeah. They they were making observations. They did know the rising and setting and period of Venus. They did know the orbit of Mars. Yeah. So these were all things that were known and well understood. Like everybody, it took them a while to figure out that Venus in the morning and Venus in the evening is the same object. Right. And so That's you know you have your mythology says one thing when one is the when it, when they're two separate objects. There's the morning star and the evening star. And then when you realize it's the same thing, then that changes your mythology. And so that's you've got this situation where your astro astronomical knowledge is informing your mythological beliefs, which I think is a really, you know, an interesting idea. And of course, here we are now where your mythological beliefs are constrained by the rules of astronomy as, as we know them, right? Bit by bit by bit. And, and one of the things that a lot of the, the tribes of the Americas really suffered from is they didn't quarry rock. So you had the Iroquois of the uh, Atlantic mm -hmm. uh, right. Northeast that built out of wood. Yeah. You had the Pueblo people who built from adobe, which is basically yeah. mud. You had the Mississippian people that built out of mud and wood. Yeah, we've got the same thing here. I mean, the yeah. the oldest structures that we have of these of the coastal nations that were on in Canada um, are like totem poles and right. you know big structures, and so they only last for a couple of hundred years. And you can go and see old totem poles that are two hundred years old that have been sitting in a rainforest coastal rainforest year after year after year and they are really worn down and the yeah. the uh you know the they're they're doing the best they can to protect them over long periods of time but and then you see a fresh one that's built and it's just like night and day and so there's you know they would be all right. gone at this point and and so we have all of the earth and mound structures scattered all over the americas but the only real structures we have are in south america where the incas and the mayans they did quarry rock yeah. And uh, so just like we have the standing stones in Europe and Britannia, uh, just like we have the Egyptian and Babylonian pyramids and South American pyramids, we know those cultures. We can see carved into the South American pyramids the pattern of Venus through the sky night after night. But North America, all this information has gotten lost because it literally rotted away. Yeah. Uh, the one thing that we do have here is petroglyphs. So yes. you can go to sandstone yeah, beach beaches and see petroglyphs carved into the rock, which is which is pretty great. Uh, well, we've reached the end of our hour. So uh, thanks, everyone, for watching us. Uh, thanks, Pamela, of course, for bringing the brain and uh, doing the show. Thanks to the mods. Thanks to the viewers. Thanks to the patrons. Thanks to everybody. I hope I got, I hope I, thanks to all humanity for watching our show. 
Except um, for the trolls. We're not true, grateful not, for the trolls. We're grateful for our mods for making go. our existence troll-free. Um, we, uh, let's see. I, I'm not sure. What we're, so maybe next week we're going to talk about some of the more modern facilities. Yeah. Uh, oh, the large binocular telescopes in that area. I love that telescope. And the Mount Graham debacle. Yeah. Um, and some of the new ones, like the uh, the new odd spectrograph yeah, is there. Um, okay, cool. Well, we'll talk about that next week. Um, let's... Uh, oh man, there's something else I was gonna remember. Oh yeah, Monday I'm gonna be talking to uh, George Dvorsky on my open space, uh, which is gonna be a lot of fun. And then the week after that is Jeff Notkin, meteorite man. Jeff Notkin. He's fabulous. Yeah, I know, isn't he? He's the yeah, greatest. He's, he's one of my favorite humans. Yeah, me too. You like you hang out with Jeff Notkin, you go like, I get it. This guy's the best. Yeah. Um, and so he is, and he's recently been, become the president of the National Space Society. So it's going to be a great time chatting with him as well. So, uh, you definitely want to come over to my YouTube channel and check those out. And we've been doing the daily space and we are building up our YouTube channel for Cosmo Quest. There are two for some reason due to the whole Google Plus versus Gmail being how you get a YouTube channel. So go to the one that actually has a whole lot of videos. Please subscribe, great. check out our archive of daily news shows. It is a great companion to Universe Today. And if you need something for Mother's Day because you have a mother in your life, check out 739studios.com this is where all of my planetary artwork goes to live and i have a bunch of stuff on sale right now so 739studios.com right 739 on. is prime and odd by the way <laughs> you're nerd yes yes i am all right we'll see you all next week <laughs> Bye bye